Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, Dr. Paul. Thank you once again take, for taking your time this evening to watch this video. And as always, we invite you to visit our website at uh, www.usmlevideos.net. That is www.usmlevideos.net where we have posted hundreds of videos ranging on almost every topic you come across in USMLE examinations. So no matter whether you take step one, step two, step three or preparing for the match, we have videos for you. So take some time to visit us. Tonight I want to talk a few minutes about uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy. You remember that uh, there are three main types of cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and restrictive cardiomyopathy. If you want to watch dilated cardiomyopathy and uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, please go to our website. But tonight I want to talk a few minutes about restrictive cardiomyopathy. Restrictive cardiomyopathy, it differs from the other two in these respects. For example, in dilated cardiomyopathy, the left ventricle is dilated, whereas in restrictive cardiomyopathy, it is not dilated. That's a very important point. It is left ventricle is normal size. Then the ventricular wall is normal in restrictive cardiomyopathy. You remember, whereas in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the ventricular wall has been hypertrophic, but in restrictive cardiomyopathy, just normal left ventricle. That's very important to notice. The second thing is there is severe diastolic dysfunction with normal systolic function. You remember in a dilated cardiomyopathy, it is systolic dysfunction, whereas in restrictive cardiomyopathy, it is diastolic dysfunction with ventricular filling defects. Because ventricles are not filling effectively, the back pressures, they get loaded up in the atrium and ultimately causes increased atrial pressures and sometimes even leading to atrial fibrillation and the formation of a thrombi and emboli. So those are the main points when we think about the pathophysiology. Then the etiology, the causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy. Most of these problems are caused by infiltrative disorders like sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, hemochromatosis. Those infiltrative disorders, they cause restrictive cardiomyopathy. In some cases, it could be primary restrictive cardiomyopathy as an inherited form, autosomal dominant restrictive cardiomyopathy. So there are many, many causes, sometimes chemotherapy, radiation, hyperesinophilic syndrome, endomyocardial fibrosis, they also cause these problems. Now coming to symptoms and signs. Symptoms and signs, these, this disease can present at any age, but most commonly it presents in the elderly. And there will be pulmonary congestion and systemic congestion. You can actually predict these symptoms. You remember the ventricle is uh, not filling, so there will be back pressure through the mitral valve into the left atrium. And the blood, as it accumulates in the left atrium, it also causes back pressure into the lungs. So it causes pulmonary congestion. You remember what happens when pulmonary congestion It presents as dyspnea, the shortness of breath, and uh, edema. Because this pulmonary congestion, it ultimately acts on the systemic venous side and the systemic venous congestion develops. It results in cirrhosis, in ascites, and when ascites, it involves all over the body, it becomes anasarca. So this is the basic uh, pathophysiology. The pulse can be normal or low volume because stroke volume has decreased the venous pressure might increase with inspiration. Remember that is it's known as Kusmal's sign. So Kusmal's sign can present as it increased uh, venous uh, pressure with, uh, sorry, increased jugular pressure with uh, respiration. 
The next thing is the third heart sound because rapid ventricular filling it abruptly stops because of the restrictive cardiomyopathy that might result in third heart sound. Now some of the evaluations what do you see on the EKG? EKG could be normal or it could be, it could show atrial fibrillation in advanced stages, STT wave abnormalities, conduction abnormalities. On chest radiograph, what do you what what you might say? You might say cardiomegaly, secondary to significant atrial enlargement. And uh, now, when we think about restrictive cardiomyopathy, clinically many times it is similar to constrictive pericarditis. Constrictive pericarditis also presents with dyspnea. It also can uh, present with uh, edema and ascites and anasarca. So you need to differentiate between these two. One thing is you can actually think in terms of uh, the causes. Most of the times constrictive pericarditis, it involves the pericardium, diseases like uh, uh, connective tissue disorders or fibrosis or tuberculosis, they involve the pericardium and causes constrictive pericarditis. The other thing on x-ray you can see some pericardial calcifications in constrictive pericarditis and the definitive marker is BNP, the brain natriuretic peptide. BNP is markedly elevated in restrictive cardiomyopathy where it, whereas it is only mildly elevated in constrictive pericarditis. So BNP, you need to remember that point, BNP is markedly elevated in restrictive cardiomyopathy. Now, let me say a few words about um, diagnosis. The definite diagnosis is, of course, endomyocardial biopsy because you can take a heart muscle and see what exactly was involved. Whether it is sarcoidosis or hemochromatosis or amyloidosis, you can definitely find out in endomyocardial biopsy. Now, treatment, there are many agents, loop diuretics, uh, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, and ultimately dual chamber pacing. If dual chamber pacing also fails, there is the only option, cardiac transplantation. So loop diuretics, they help because they decrease that uh, filling pressures in the ventricles and atria because they take away that excessive volume that is being accumulated in the lungs and systemic circulation. So loop diuretics, they help. Then secondly, calcium channel blockers like verapamil. Calcium channel blockers, they improve diastolic dysfunction via control. They rate control and uh, as they control the ventricular rate, they give you more time to fill the ventricles. So ventricular filling pressures, they increases. And secondly, the beta blockers, they also help by reducing the heart rate. Then angiotensin converting enzyme um, inhibitors, ACE inhibitors are angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. Both of these drugs, they have proven record when, whenever the patient has uh, diastolic filling dysfunction. So they help and uh, then finally we need to take a note about uh, atrial fibrillation. Some of these patients because of the increased ventricular filling pressures might end up in atrial fibrillation. So when the patients develop atrial fibrillation, you need to use um, warfarin for anticoagulation and follow proteome and INR. So those are the most important points about uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy. I hope you got some certain points and uh, you can always post your comments and questions in the uh, comment section and we're on our website at www.usmlevideos.net. That is www.usmlevideos.net. Thank you. Have a good night.